with us today. I am Shane Webb. I'm the pastor here at Woodhaven Presbyterian Church. And more importantly today, I'm Carol's pastor. In the Presbyterian tradition, this is a service of witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we invite you to cry and laugh and emote as it is appropriate for you. Uh, we will be having a little bit of fun today, uh, so we hope that you will join us in that. Um, but we also acknowledge that our hearts also are full of sorrow because we will miss uh, Carol being here present with us. This will be a joyful service because we are celebrating a life well lived. And we believe that Carol is now reunited with her maker as a new creation, free from pain and suffering. So friends, I want you to take a moment and find your devices because this is going to be a beautiful service. We don't want any interruptions. Uh, and I had mine on, so I want you to check yours too because it's always possible that you forgot or it's still on. So please take a moment and help us with that. You don't want to be the one to interrupt the beautiful music or my lovely reflection, okay? So I want you to hear these words from 2 Corinthians that explain why exactly we're celebrating today. We do not lose hearts. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure, because we look not at what can be seen, but what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Amen. Friends, I believe that is a hope worth celebrating. So we will keep that going throughout our service today. I have one final announcement for you. Um, you may know that the family is from out of state. Uh, so to help them, if you would like to stay in contact out in the narthex, and we will also have it over in the fellowship hall, we have a list that you can leave your phone number, your email, your address, or all of the above, uh, so that you can stay in contact with the family and they can stay in contact with you. So if that's something you would like to do, that is available, so I wanted to make note of that. Now, during the service, you may see me running back and forth because I like to sing, and hopefully my mic when we're singing will be muted, right, Scott? <laughs> so without further ado, we have some special music for you, uh, beginning with a beautiful piece with a voice of singing.
At this, this time, I invite you to read responsively with me some sentences of scripture that will serve as our call to worship. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Those who believe in me, even though they die. The inheritance to which we are born is one that nothing can destroy or spoil or wither. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear God. As a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you, says the Lord. I invite you to please stand as we sing our hymn of confession and pardon, Amazing Grace. may be seated. I invite you at this time to please lift your spirits with me in prayer as we have a prayer of invocation. O God who gave us birth, you are ever more ready to hear than we are to pray. You know our needs before we ask, and our ignorance in asking. We ask today that you show us your grace, that as we face the mystery of death, we may see the light of eternity. Speak to us once more your solemn message of life and death. Help us to live as those who are prepared to die. And when our days here are ended, Enable us to die as those who go forth to live, so that living or dying, our life may be in Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, and all God's people said, Amen. We have two scripture readings for you this morning. The first one will be Psalm 100. A 
psalm of thanksgiving. Shout triumphantly to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with celebration. Come before him with shouts of joy. Know that the Lord is God. He made us. We belong to him. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanks. Enter his courtyards with praise. Thank him, bless his name, because the Lord is good. His loyal love lasts forever. His faithfulness lasts generation after generation. And now we will have a reading from the Gospel of Luke. reading from Luke chapter 8, verse 16 to 18, sharing the light. No one lights a lamp and then covers it with a bowl or puts it under a bed. Instead, they put it on top of a lampstand so that those who enter can see the light. Nothing is hidden that won't be exposed, nor is anything concealed that won't be made known and brought to the light. Therefore, listen carefully. Those who have will receive more. But as for those who don't have, even what they seem to have will be taken away from them. been a friend of Carol's for 60 years. We first met our first year teaching in a small town called Ilium, New York. It was a rural community in the Mohawk Valley, noted mainly for its gun factory, Remington Arms. We bonded immediately, and of course, who could not be friends with Carol with that winning smile? Carol and I were to some, even though we didn't live together. The first year she lived in an apartment, I lived in a room that cost me $10 a week. Our first salary was $4,800 the first year. At any rate, we agreed to room together the second year, and we had an apartment where we paid $33 a piece, so it was affordable. And we found out that, I found out that Carol liked to cook. And I was not particularly gifted in that department. So I did like to clean. So it was an arrangement made in heaven. <laughs> a friendship developed over those years, and we had several interests in common. One is we both like to shop, we both like to travel, and we both were interested in music. I played piano for many, many years. Now, Ilian probably lacked a real social life for two young women. And the only thing that it had to offer was a fish fry on Friday night at the Wagon Wheel restaurant. So needless to say, we were looking to get out, and we decided to go to the University of Buffalo for our master's degree. So we moved to Buffalo, got our master's degree, and then she found a job at a local school brought home an application for me, and we both ended up teaching at the same school. She in the elementary, I in the high school. Now, our friendship was forged during those early years with a great social life and many friends. We traveled cross country one year in Carol's Blue Corvair, a car that had no air conditioning. And if you remember, Ralph Nader said, that car was unsafe at any speed. <laughs> <laughs> now, we managed to drive through Route 66 to LA, visiting my aunt. The unsafe Corvair made it across the desert, although it did overheat numerous times. In order to cross the desert to get to LA, we had to leave at 12 midnight and cross the desert at night so the Corvair wouldn't overheat and strand us. 
Uh, in the daytime, we could always count on the truckers to stop for us and to help us out. But during the night, we weren't so sure. So at any rate, fol trips followed, some to Greece, some to Florida every Easter. And then a return trip to California, the northern route, in my 1969 Cutlass. Although a real beauty, it did not have air either. So again, a struggle. We both married in the 70s, and our husbands were friends, so there were many dinners around our table. We partied together, and as a foursome, we vacationed together. Even the move to Texas did not break the bond, as the Sullivans visited Buffalo twice a year, once at Christmas time and once in the summer. My kids could hardly wait for Aunt Carol to come. It always meant presents and singing and lots of fun. Piano duets were a must when Carol was in town. We usually had had some wine and thought that our duets sounded great. <laughs> Others begged to disagree. The Sullivan visits also meant long fancy dinners, sometimes short casual dinners, but always beer and wine. It was in truth some of the happiest days of our lives. Even after Bill had passed, Carol continued to visit us either in Buffalo or Fort Myers, our new winter retreat. Eventually, she convinced me to come to Dallas for my first concert at age 65. Who else but Jimmy Buffett? <laughs> it was a memorable trip, becoming a pair of them. It also included a tour of the Cowboys Stadium. Wow, what an eye-opener of a stadium that was. Just, I kept thinking to what Buffalo had at the time. And, and this stadium had marble floors and it was unreal. Something to really look and aspire to. But with COVID, many things changed and so too did our visits. So it is with sadness that we are here, but I will not forget my friend, Carol Chardonnay. And I will drink a glass tonight, honoring her and remembering her smile, her laugh, and the many good times that we shared. Thank you. I don't wear my heels all that often anymore. <laughs> well, first I'd like to thank you. I mean, your music is amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, my name is Gail. I'm Carol's sister-in-law, but more than that, we're good friends. Even before Dave and I were married, Carol welcomed me with open arms into the family. In support of the family resort business on Black Lake, Carol had to help her mom clean all the camps each week. She did not enjoy it, and she especially did not like and care of the fish cleanings. I think part of the reason that Carol was so happy to have me join the family was that she could relinquish some of those chores to me. Dave tells me that Carol would be in trouble growing up for taking the butter that was rationed at the time out of the refrigerator and eating it by the stick. He also tells me that in the family house on Black Lake that was built in 1831 with no heat upstairs that Carol would make him sleep next to her to keep her warm on cold nights. And that's not something that a brother would want to do. Both Ken and Dave thought Carol was spoiled because she was the only girl. Carol felt that Dave was spoiled one because he was the baby. Carol may not have been spoiled, but she was the apple of her parents' eyes. Everyone in Rochester and Buffalo looked forward to Carol's annual visits. Whether it was summer or Christmas, Mike and Lynn would usually request Carol's chicken and dumplings. Carol also loved to make her stuffed cabbage rolls, enough to feed an army. She was a good cook, but boy, I think she used every pot, pan, bowl, and utensil in the kitchen, but I gladly cleaned up after her delicious meals. And I'm sure Bill was a dishwasher 
at home when Carol cooked. Carol was always a part of the parties held either at our house or our friends' houses when she was in town. She was considered a friend to many in Rochester who enjoyed her silly antics, her singing, and her sincere enjoyment of socializing. That was probably true when she visited Buffalo, too. She was known as Aunt Carol to all of Lynn's and Mike's friends, and also our friends that call her Aunt Carol. On some of her visits, we would take a trip to New Hampshire to see Mike, Aaron, Max, and Violet, her great niece and nephew, and of course at Christmas, the presents to Max and Violet were always musical. Carol was also able to visit Lynn's lovely apartment in Charlotte, in North Carolina, and once while we were there, we all went to the Quail Run PGA Tournament, and we were able to see some of my favorite golfers. Carol was very proud to see how successful Mike is in in his career as a commercial pilot, sorry, corporate pilot, with his beautiful family. Carol was certainly happy that Lynn followed in Carol's footsteps as a teacher. Carol really wanted to go to Lynn's classroom to teach Lynn students music, but only had that opportunity once. The kids liked it, but I think Carol liked it more. At Christmas, she enjoyed all of the family traditions. Every Christmas Eve, part of Dave's gifts to Carol, me, Mike, Lynn, and my mom, when she was still alive, was to cook wonderful seafood dinner for us. He set the table with china and candles, and he would not let us in the kitchen to help, her, help him cook, which was very hard for Carol, and he did all the cleanup. We also opened one present Christmas Eve, and the kids had a tough time deciding which gift out of the many packages that Carol sent north to open. Christmas morning, we saw that Santa had left us all his stocking, and we would look to see what he left us. Then we would have our breakfast. After breakfast, we would go to church. Of course, the tempo of the music was too slow, among other flaws, and certainly not up to her standards. <laughs> Later on in the day, my sisters with their husbands and kids, along with my brother, would come to open presents, after which we would have a nice Christmas dinner. It was nice and cozy being in the warm house while the snow was falling outside. I don't think that Carol missed the snow when she got back down here to Texas. Carol just loved her years of teaching. She knew that music helped children learn other subjects, and she excelled at instilling enthusiasm for music in her students. She organized and conducted many concerts that the kids enjoyed and made their parents so proud. She looked forward to the trips to San Antonio to learn current teaching methods and new music. Her years in the Urban Corral were a very important part of her life. She loved going to practice. She was always so excited to help with the Christmas fundraiser, the wreaths and the table centers, not to mention the trips to Europe and what a privilege and thrill to sing in those venues. She eventually changed churches so that she could be a part of the music ministry here at Woodhaven by becoming a member of the Chancel Choir. One memory that stands out in my mind is that I actually had the audacity to question the lyrics of a song that she was singing. That was the first and last time I ever did that. <laughs> my favorite memory of Carol Harbour that I will truly miss is whether we were in Rochester or at her house, we both couldn't wait to get into our nightgowns and bathrobes in the evening and enjoy a glass of Chardonnay and watch TV. Carol often threw her eyelids. We always look forward to our bonding time. Carol has had a few nicknames in the past. One was Cookie. Dave will explain that. Um, another was Sarge. That's self-explanatory. <laughs> As was her last nickname, Carol Chardonnay, also self-explanatory. There are many adjectives we can use to describe Carol. Funny, kind, sincere, generous, loyal, intelligent, fun to be with, and many more, all good. I know that we are her biological, biological family, but she certainly had a wonderful family of friends here in Dallas that she dearly loved. Hi, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dave Whitek. I'm Carol's brother. Um, we also have a brother, Ken, who lives in California. He is unable to make it here because of health reasons, so he asked me to read a quick note from him about Carol. He's our older brother, by the way. 
I am Ken Whitek, the first child born to Ruby and Marge Whitek, and the older brother of Carol, the sister we remember this day. Carol was always noisy as a baby at the matinee movies at the Enjoy Theater of Johnson City, where she was born, and had to be quieted in the ladies' room by mom during these matinees. They went to these matinees during the time when my father was an aircraft mechanics mate in the Pacific during World War II. Those episodes of quieting in the ladies' room probably accounted for her singing voice later in a musical instruction career <laughs> that spanned many wonderful years in New York and Texas, serving grade school artists in process, punctuated by several concert tours in chorale productions at home and abroad. Her legacy was enhanced by her love of music, all music, and the positive effect on hundreds of little people she introduced and instructed to the art. We and they will appreciate the influence and practical experience that she applied to a special career, now and forever as she is gone, but not forgotten, at least not by me. May the angels produce a chorus of her favorites in heaven. And as Gail alluded to, the uh, nickname Cookie we found out just this morning, I got a text here in the church, that uh, my brother recalled that she was named after a character in a radio show at the time who was also rather boisterous and unruly. <laughs> so it applied to her very well. And I wanted to take this minute to just, I, Carol would be floored by the music and the turnout today. I, I know as I listen to you folks sing, I'm, I wish she was here. Okay. Abe Lincoln once said, in the end, it's not the years in your life that count, but rather the life in your years. Carol certainly packed a lot of life into her 82 years on the planet. Carol was born in 1942 in Johnson City, New York. She lived there surrounded by mom, dad, brother Ken, and a large extended family. These relatives were very supportive when our dad went to war in the Pacific. Carol and Ken both enrolled in colleges in Potsdam. Oh, I think I'm out of order here. Hang on. doubled up, sorry. It's not usually this humid in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Who'd have figured? Okay. In 1949, our father decided to start his own business, and they moved to Black Lake in northern New York, and I mean way north in New York. It was a rural area with no relatives close by, where she shared in the work of running a small resort. So her life was changed considerably from her life in Johnson City. I joined the family in 1950. During her school years, I remember we all had to listen to her bang on the old piano in our house and practice her clarinet. By the way, clarinet was her major in college. Carol graduated from high school in a senior class of only 12 people. So it was very rural. Carol and Ken both enrolled in colleges in Potsdam, New York, so we bought a second house there where we lived in the winters. Carol graduated from the prestigious Crane School of Music in Potsdam. Then she went on to live and teach for 10 years in Buffalo, New York, with Phyllis, where she earned her master's degree and met Phyllis there. Actually, I guess it was in Ilium. Phyllis and Carol became good friends lived together and traveled extensively, as you've already heard. Carol met Bill Sullivan in Buffalo, and they were married on the 4th of July, 1975. They were avid Buffalo Bills fans, and Gail and I would occasionally join them at home games. Carol and Bill were also avid golfers, and I sometimes got to play with them. After Carol and Bill moved to Texas, she still made a point of visiting us Northerners every summer and Christmas as well as other family events. She loved to cook during those events, her visits, and we looked forward to her meals.
Carol and Bill became members at several country clubs, and I enjoyed playing at those clubs on our infrequent trips to Texas. Many of you may not know that she shot four holes in one during her years at golf. She and Bill also went on many golf vacations. Carol lost Bill to cancer in 2001, but she recovered from that and continued her active lifestyle with friends and family, including continued frequent visits up north. She eventually gave me her golf clubs, and I still use them, and I think of her on every stroke. Unfortunately, I think of her often. Lots of strokes. <laughs> Carol loved to eat out, so much so that, to te that Tio Carlos, Vito's, and other area restaurants will probably see a decline in business with her passing. <laughs> While traveling, she had a sometimes annoying habit of singing road signs. Any of you who ever travel in a car with her may know what I'm talking about. It drove me nuts. Through it all, she had her bubbly personality and beaming smile. These are but a few of the many memories I have of Carol. The last few years of my sister's life were very difficult for her. Moving out of her home, taking away her car and the independence it represents, being housebound away from her friends and musical pursuits, and ultimately losing her mental faculties. She made it through those times with the help of her many wonderful friends, all of you. Managing her affairs during this transition time was made easier through your efforts. And I don't know how Gail and I could have done it without you. You all played a large part in making her hard times better, and we thank you for that. Carol and Bill never had children, but Carol loved kids. She loved and played an important part in the lives of the Witek and Stasiowski kids. She was always fussing over any little ones she happened to meet out and about. Then there are those thousands of school children whose education was enriched because they had Mrs. Sullivan as a teacher. Over the last couple of weeks, I've seen dozens of testimonials from past students recounting the effect Carol had on their lives. We adults certainly benefited from having Carol in our lives. She was an influencer before there was such a thing as an influencer. She was a nut, but she was our nut. <laughs> I will miss her terribly. Thank you, Carol, for all that you were.
Thank you, choir. I've worked at the sweat lamp. <laughs> well, we don't want to be here all day. This has been a wonderful service, so I'm going to keep my reflections short. You're welcome. <laughs> Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. Help me out, choir. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Long after she retired, any time I talked with Carol, she almost always had a song for me. <laughs> I'm going to miss her making up songs about anything and everything. I didn't get trapped in a car with her, so I thought it was cute. <laughs> or responding to something that I said with a ditty from a song she used with the kids long ago. Whether we're working together at VBS, or chatting before choir practice, the music teacher in Carol was always present. Amen? <laughs> Our choir directors that are here today, Harry and Tracy, thank you, gentlemen, they can attest that Carol was a delightful person. She was also a character <laughs> and a passionate musician. And I want to thank, again, the Irving Corral. Uh, because some of her friends in the chorale invited her to come and sing in our Woodhaven Church Choir. And we were blessed with her voice and cheery music teacher vibe uh, for the last five years. Even as our, her health began to deteriorate, she was quick to share a kind word, and always with her smile. She had the strength of always being positive and supportive, yet on the inside she was often hurting. Many people cope with their depression by acting more positive than they feel. She was encouraging to others, myself included, and yet she was the hardest on herself. Long before I knew Carol, she was pouring her heart and soul into the children of Irving as she taught them how to fall in love with music. And we have heard how Carol was a blessing to so many. She was not perfect, and she had her struggles, yet through it all she let her light shine. And I had to get her back by singing a song at her memorial, as she always sang to me. <laughs> Through her joy and love of music, she inspired generation after generation. Her Christian faith as a Catholic, and then thanks to the grace of God, later as a Presbyterian, <laughs> showed brightly for the world to see. Her spirit beamed with childlike faith. So for this reason, I just had to get her back and sing a children's song at her celebration of life, which I've never done before. <laughs> but I'm glad I did. I am so thankful for the short time I got to be her pastor and experience her light. So thank you, sister. And I think the lyrics of the Abba song that we heard earlier that is found on the back of the bulletin, Thank You for the Music, is a fitting send-off for our beloved sister in Christ. Hear these lyrics. So I say thank you for the music, the songs I'm singing. Thanks for all the joy they're bringing. Who can live without it? I ask in all honesty, what would life be? Without a song or a dance, what are we? So I say thank you for the music and for giving it to me. Because everyone listens when I start to sing. I'm 
so grateful and proud. All I want to do is sing it out loud. Thank you, Carol, for inspiring us with your singing and for always shining your light. May an angel chorus greet you in heaven, my dear friend, our beloved Carol Chardonnay. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. As an affirmation of faith, I'm going to invite us to recite together the 23rd Psalm. This is the King James Version because it just sounds more pretty that way. Amen. So let us read together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff may comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I dwell in the house of the Lord forever.
I'm booking the Irving Corral in advance for my funeral. <laughs> Just let it be known for the public record. <laughs> Beloved, I invite you now to join with me once more in prayer. At the conclusion of this prayer, we will join together in praying the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray as one. Spirit of light, fill us with your comfort and joy as we say goodbye to one of your beloved children. We celebrate her life and that she was able to touch so many people with her love and music. Keep her memory close in our hearts as she continues to encourage us through those lives she touched the stories we share, and the songs we sing. Grant our sister Carol your eternal peace and rest. Almighty God, in Jesus Christ, you promised many rooms within your house. Give us faith to see beyond touch and sight some sure sign of your kingdom, and where vision fails, to trust your love which never fails. We ask that you lift heavy sorrow and give us good hope in Jesus so we may bravely walk our earthly way, letting our light also shine brightly. And may we look forward to the glad reunion in the life to come where we will once again sing with care. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. And because we are God's blessed children, let us now pray as Jesus taught us so long ago, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand as we sing Joyful, Joyful.
Beloved, we go forth this day. I pray that you have a moment to join the family and the choir and all the friends over in Hancock Hall, our fellowship hall. You can make your way straight out the steps or you can go to the side. Uh, we will let the family go first uh, so that we don't get clogged up here in the narthex. Uh, so once uh, they are over there, uh, then we will invite you to follow. Uh, so please take a moment and give your thanks to the family. Friends, we go forth with love in our hearts, with music filling our ears. And we thank Carol for a life well lived, for the joy that she brought to each and every one of us this day. So go forth knowing that you are all gifted and beloved children of God. So may the overwhelming grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the incredible love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with y'all right now in this moment and forevermore. And all God's people said,